we are honored to welcome Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva to our campus at an important moment for the IMF as they approach their annual meetings here in Washington. In this program, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva delivers her curtain raiser speech at Georgetown University to an audience preparing for their professional lives in a world that is very different from the one they grew up in. This generation here has never lived in a world of rising poverty. Mm -hmm. They've lived in a world, in fact, probably one of the greatest periods of poverty reduction the world has ever known. They've lived in a world of stable prices. They don't remember high yeah. inflation of the, of the early 80s. Um, they've lived in a world of you know, increasing global integration. With shock upon shock hitting the world economy in the past couple of years, Georgieva's customary opening speech to the annual meetings warned of a darker global outlook and emphasized the need for the world to come together to deal with the consequences. It is an honor to welcome to the podium Kristalina Georgieva. Thank you very much, President. Di Gioia, Dean Hellman, faculty, students, for giving me this opportunity to be with you today. Uh, we are in Gaston Hall, and I stand in front of you. Behind me is the painting of Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, and a very good reference point for what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Our world economy is like ship in choppy waters. We need all the wisdom we can muster to steady the ship and navigate through what lies ahead. In less than three years, we live through shock after shock after shock. First, COVID, then Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and climate disasters on all continents. These shocks have caused immense harm on people's lives. Their combined impact is driving a global surge in prices, especially on food and energy, causing a cost of living crisis. And dealing with them is made harder by geopolitical fragmentation. We are experiencing a fundamental shift in the world economy from one of relative predictability with the rules-based framework uh, on international economic cooperation, very low interest rates, low inflation, to a world with more fragility greater uncertainty, higher economic volatility, geopolitical confrontations, and more frequent and devastating natural disasters. A world in which any country can be thrown off course more easily and more often. So what can we do to prevent this period of heightened fragility from becoming the new normal, from becoming the world you would be living in. First and foremost, we must stabilize the global economy, steady the ship by addressing the most immediate challenges. And as we address the crisis of today, we must revitalize global cooperation and transform our economies so they can withstand the shocks to come in the future. And this is why at the IMF, we are calling for early and joint action to regroup and to rethink how can we adopt a more proactive, precautionary mindset than we had in the past, and more willingness to act now and act together. This will be the focus of our annual meetings uh, when they start next week. 
Uh, you are very familiar for all the arrivals of ministers, uh, delegations. This year, our discussions are so very important for the future we build. So let me start with the urgency to stabilize the economy given the darkening economic outlook. Last October, we projected a strong recovery from the depths of the COVID crisis. We finished uh, the year with 6.1% global growth, very respectable. And most economists, including we at the IMF, uh, were predicting the recovery to continue, inflation to subside quickly, largely because we expected vaccines will help fame supply-side disruptions and allow the economies to rebound. But this is not what happened. Multiple shocks, among them a senseless war, changed the economic picture dramatically. Far from being transitory, as we thought, inflation is much more persistent. High energy and food prices, tighter financial conditions, lingering supply disruptions, decelerate growth. All of the world's largest economies are now slowing down. The euro area is severely affected by the reduction of gas supplies from Russia. China suffers from pandemic-related disruptions and a deepening downturn of their real estate market. And while the US still has a fairly vibrant and strong labor market, momentum is slowing down. Why? Because inflation is reducing disposable income of people and consumer demand as a result is falling down and higher interest rates are a drag on investments. This in turn affects emerging markets in developing countries. They face re reduced demand for their exports and tighter financial conditions for those of them with high level of uh, dollar denominated debt. This is pretty dramatic. So what is happening is we have downgraded three times since October last year our growth projections. Uh, last time we brought 22 to 3.2 percent growth and uh, for 23 projections was 2.9 percent. We will see we always come around the annual meetings with our world economic outlook that we are further downgrading our growth projections for next year. And we will be flagging that the risks of recession are rising. Our estimate is that one third of countries around the world, this is the one third share of the world economy, would experience at least two consecutive quarters of contraction this year and next year. And even in countries where growth is positive, for hundreds and millions of people, it would feel like recession because inflation is eating into real incomes. Overall, we expect global output as a result of all this to shrink between now and 26, 2026 by $4 trillion. To give you a sense what is $4 trillion, this is the size of the German economy. Gone. And unfortunately, I am the natural optimist, but today I stand in front of you and I need to say more likely to get worse than to get better. In other words, risks are, as we say, at the fund on the downside. Why? Because uncertainty is very high in the context of war and a pandemic that hasn't quite left the scene. And what we see, and this is very concerning, is that financial stability risks are growing. Rapid and disorderly repricing of assets, especially where there are underlying vulnerabilities, can play a dangerous role for financial stability. So this is the picture, darker than we would have loved it to be what can be done. And this is what our meetings are to wrestle with. 
How can policymakers stabilize the economy? Let me outline three priorities, and they're really, really important, starting from stay the course to bring inflation down. We make a misstep, the cost can be very significant. Not tightening enough would cause inflation to become de-anchored and entrenched, so with us for a long time, and that would require interest rates to tighten even more to bring it down. And that would cause tremendous harm on people, but also on prospects for growth. On the other hand, if we tighten too much, too fast, and do so in synchronized manner, we can push many economies into prolonged recession. So far, so far, we see a relatively good shift. Tightening is leading to uh, taking somewhat the heat out of domestic demand, including in the housing markets. Of course, not good if you are on the market right now, but it means that we are slowing down the risk for the economy. But we are not there yet. Central banks have to continue to respond. In the current environment, as painful that may be, this is the right thing to do. Even if the economy slows down as a result, not easy, not without pain, but less pain if we take a look into the future. Do the right thing now. Now, we have monetary policy tightening. What about fiscal policy? Our second priority is for fiscal policy to act responsibly, to protect the most vulnerable households and businesses. In other words, to act without fueling inflation to be a source of stability for the most vulnerable parts of society. Now, we have a, a, a severe cost of living crisis in some countries already very painful on low-income households. So there has to be a helping hand for them. But these measures need to be very well targeted. Don't provide subsidies to the rich. Don't go for blanket price controls that benefit the poor, but also benefit the wealthy. And make sure that these measures are temporary, that you are not embedding them in the economies forever. Where high energy prices are, are likely to persist, governments could provide direct help to low and middle income families and minimize the use of price controls. Why? Because we have learned the hard way that price controls, not affordable, not very effective. And avoiding this indiscriminatory fiscal support is very important for successfully fighting inflation. Just to give you a very simple image, when the monetary policy is stepping on the brakes, fiscal policy should not step on the accelerator. Otherwise, we are for a very rough and dangerous ride. Our third priority is joint efforts to support emerging markets and developing economies. A stronger dollar, high borrowing cost, capital outflows, they cause a triple blow on emerging markets and developing economies. And what it means for them is probability of portfolio outflows going up. Uh, and we put now the risk of this happening over the next three quarters at 40%. That could cause a tremendous problem for countries with large external financing needs. Now, one thing we always recommend is to maintain exchange rate flexibility, but also countries can take a more proactive approach. They can take precautionary steps before a crisis emerges. Uh, we have uh, provided a policy tool, it is called Integrated Policy Framework, to help countries calibrate the best possible policies. And then we have precautionary lending instruments so they can use them to cushion themselves against risks. And uh, 
uh, one thing that you probably have read and heard about a lot, the problem of debt. During COVID, what did governments do to help their people and their economies? They borrowed. Debt has gone up. Now we are in a situation in which for emerging markets, more than a quarter of them have either defaulted or have bonds that are trading in distress territory. And what is very uh, difficult to accept is that the picture is much worse in low-income countries. Over 60% of low-income countries are at or near that distress. What does it mean? Well, when you have numbers growing, then the risk of a debt crisis grows as well. And if it is to happen, it would not only harm people in these countries, but it would harm global growth and global financial stability. So we have to reduce the risk of, of this uh, debt crisis. Two years ago, uh, a platform was developed. It is called Common Framework for Debt uh, Resolution, which brings all creditors around the table, both official and uh, private sector creditors, to provide debt relief to countries that ask for it. Three countries asked, Zambia, Chad, and Ethiopia. It has taken a long time, but finally we have an agreement on Zambia. We need faster, more predictable functioning of the common framework. And it is very important that large creditors bear their responsibility to act, like China and the private sector. It is not only the right thing to do for countries, it is in their interest to act early to prevent a debt crisis. So these are the immediate actions we have to take. Hopefully, we, you will see us coming out of the meetings strong on taking these actions. But that is not going to be enough for our future. We need transformational reforms, and we need to support our members in undertaking these reforms. This is the focus of our work. So let me give you an example, public finance. We are well known for this being our bread and butter. Countries can use medium-term fiscal sustainability frameworks to define space to invest in long-term objectives. Education, health, social protection, but also digitalization to open the doors for innovation and for cutting-edge digital government services that are more transparent and more efficient. And think how we can use smart policies that we have been using in countries already. We know how to do that. So we can enable a digital-ready workforce to help people, especially young people, enter the workforce and stay there. Uh, we are also very keen for financial inclusion to open the door for innovation and participation of those who bring the future naturally with them. So we, yes, we have some ability to project a more resilient future, but let me be very clear. That can only happen if countries work together. We have to face to the chilling effects of fragmentation. We cannot afford the world to break apart. We need to step up our efforts and raise our voices. We need each other. And let me talk about some of the areas where we need each other. We cannot succeed working alone. First, food security. Breaks my heart that we are going backwards on hunger. Hunger is the world's greatest solvable problem. But instead of solving it, we are marching backwards. Today, 345 million people are acutely insecure. What does acutely mean? They are desperate. Mothers and fathers cannot feed their children. So the world has to unite around addressing food security. We at the IMF just created a new food shock window in our emergency financing so we can provide help to countries. We have identified $9 billion 
dollars in balance of payment needs, and we want to be part of the solution to countries that face this problem. Another um, obvious area where we need each other is climate change. It is an existential threat to humanity. We can survive inflation, we can survive recession, we cannot survive unmitigated climate crisis. We simply cannot. We have COP27, we have to use it to mobilize action. Uh, at the Fund, we have done something really fantastic. We have created our first ever long-term financing instrument. It is called Resilience and Sustainability Trust. We already have $40 billion for it. Two countries crossed the finish line, Barbados and Costa Rica, to be the first to benefit from it. What we want is to use it primarily to remove barriers for private investment because we need capital on scale for countries to succeed. We have done tremendous work in capacity development. Just imagine we have provided policy capacity development support to 174 countries since the pandemic started. In key areas like domestic revenue mobilization, debt sustainability, public investment management. And we, of course, are a financier. Since the pandemic, we have provided $258 billion to 93 countries. And since the Russia invasion, we have supported 16 countries with $90 billion. This comes on top of $650 billion SDR allocation we did last year. So, the IMF is stepping up in a more shock-prone world. And I promise you, I promise you, we will continue to do so. Working together, we can have a better future for absolutely everyone, everywhere on our planet. And with this, I thank you. That was IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva at Georgetown University delivering the curtain raiser speech to next week's IMF World Bank annual meetings. Go to imf.org to follow the meetings and find all the flagship reports, including the World Economic Outlook, the Global Financial Stability Report, and the Fiscal Monitor. Look for other IMF podcasts wherever you listen, and our Twitter handle is at IMF underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. Thanks for listening.